In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, both now and ever into the ages of ages. Amen. Glory to thee, O God. Glory to thee, O heavenly King, comfort the spirit of truth, who are everywhere, present and fill us all things, treasure of blessings and gear of life, come and abide in us and cleanse us from every impurity, and save our souls for good one. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, both now and ever into the ages of ages. Amen. Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, Lord of mercy, through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Amen. Good evening to everyone. Uh, thank you for showing up. Uh, if anyone else is going to join us, is welcome to do so. Uh, just uh, you know, click on the link. Uh, as you know, uh, the last time we talked about uh, the book of Didahi, we finished the book of Didahi. Actually, last Wednesday we, we had some uh, questions and answers about different things. So uh, the intention was to write off to reading of the the, the book of Didahi in Turkening it as much as we, we were able to do in a few sessions. Uh, I invited Father Matthew to, who all of you know him, uh, to give us a little bit of insight regarding the early church fathers. So he will pick, for example, for each Bible study every Wednesday uh, or every uh, few times uh, in a row, depending on the, how the lecture want, he wants to be to talk about the early church fathers. So I think he has prepared the, uh, for us now the uh, St. Um, Ignatius. Uh, so we will, uh, I will transfer Father Matthew to be the, the co-host so he can uh, start with his lecture. He also has some presentations as well. So I think it's a very important uh, thing to learn about the early church fathers. As we have said many, many times, the Orthodox Church starts with the Pentecost and it is the apostolic succession uh, which uh, within the holy tradition of the church that moves from one generation to another generation. And it's very important, it's crucial to know that the, apostle, the apostles, they didn't just uh, uh, finish the church when they passed away from this life to the, to the eternal life, but they moved uh, the, the apostolic succession to the first generations of the bishops. So we wanna learn about the, the church history, uh, the, the first church fathers who were the true descendants of the apostles at the very early stage. So that's why we have Father Matthew here with us to, to talk about that a little bit more. If you all know, yesterday I also sent you an email with the book of uh, Cassiani, uh, Hunchback Jula, that's a translation that we did. Uh, I'm asking you all, it's only for our Bible study uh, purposes to review it, if you think that maybe there is some mistakes, grammatical or otherwise, uh, feel free to add on your PDF file and send it back to me so we can correct those things. We would like to God only publish that book. I think it's very important, that book, because a side of the story, which is very interesting, inside of it, there is what we call, in Serbian, we call it Stoslov Ljubavi, or a hundred words uh, about love. Uh, when I read the first time this book, it uh, gave me such a powerful impression that I think it's very rare to find such a bountiful treasure of theology just in this little booklet that I read by St. Nikolai Vilimirovic of Serbia, whom we, as you know, uh, celebrating the Orthodox Church and the Serbian Orthodox Church as a saint. And uh, he was also, we call him a bishop of Ohrid in Žica. Žica is a monastery in Serbia, but also a bishop of South Canaan because he died here in the United States and his relics were later uh, translated in, in, in transferred into Serbia where, where he's venerated as a saint in the old Orthodox Church. So uh, God willing, you can read that book uh, in your uh, spare time at home. Uh, and once when we finish with this sessions with, uh, with the early church fathers, we can come back to that book. And then of course we have the ideas to start with um, get on the Emilianos of Simon Petra uh, with the book of the authentic seal about the catechism and prayer. So these are all things that we want to do in the future. For now, we're just going to focus on the early church fathers with uh, Father Matthew. So with that being said, guys, uh, you know that we finished with the uh, with the Didahi. I'm now going to transfer to Father Matthew. I'm going to make him, uh, I'm going to allow him to, so he can be able to share with us the, um, uh, the his lecture. Let me see my host. Okay. There it is. Okay, Father Matthew, it's uh, you're on. Uh, okay. And you can start. Okay, Fabulous. I'm just going to share my screen with you. Please tell me if you can if you can see this. We can see it. Okay. We can see it. We can see it. Okay, Fabulous. And I'm just gonna do this one thing okay very good so so well, thank you so much father Borion, for inviting me here to to talk with you all tonight this is really such a 
an honor and a pleasure um, to be able to share words about the Apostolic Fathers and uh, specifically about St. Ignatius. Um, I thought that, I'm sorry, I thought that what I might do is just sort of introduce a little bit of just the terminology of what we mean by the term apostolic fathers. So um, this is a term that has been used for the last several hundred years to describe a group of early writings that post date the New Testament. Uh, and um, it is it is not an ancient term that uh, one finds in, in, the, in the church, but it's a term that is used by modern day scholars to describe a group of 10 writings in particular and here's a list of them on the screen for you right now. They're in basically in rough chronological order here. Some of them, uh, the, so the, the last writings of the New Testament, which are thought to be the Revelation of St. John and the Gospel of St. John, uh, perhaps some of his the three epistles as well, all date from the early 90s, it is assumed, um, AD. And, uh, and right around that same time, and still in that same decade, we get some of the writings of the apostolic fathers. Now, what does it mean to be, uh, what, do, what do we mean by that term? Uh, so the, the, the apostolic fathers are grouped together because they are writers who were not themselves actually part of the original apostles, but were all somehow connected to them. So for instance, um, uh, uh, Polycarp is uh, the disciple of St. John, uh, of, the, uh, you know, of the evangelist St. John. And, um, uh, and other, uh, and the Didache, for instance, or the Didache in, in the uh, in modern pronunciation is uh, a writing that is described as being the teaching of the 12 apostles. So they're all writers who were very, very close, likewise, um, uh, Papias is a uh, number four there is also thought to be one of the uh, disciples of, uh, uh, I believe it is of, uh, it, it may, maybe uh, not disciples is the right word, but somebody who is very closely connected with, I, I'm forgetting actually now, I think it's either St. Peter or St. Mark. Um, but uh, all of these early writings of the church are very, very close. They're the, they're the earliest church writings right after the New Testament. And uh, just as Father Borian was saying in the intro, um, these writings are very, very important for us as Orthodox Christians, because what they show is that everything that we believe, as Orthodox Christians and everything that we practice inside of the church, the sacraments, the uh, understanding of the hierarchy of the church with bishops, priests, and deacons, baptism, Eucharist, going to confession, fasting on Wednesdays and Fridays, all of these things that are essential aspects of our faith, all were there from the very beginning. Um, you know, it is one of the sort of abiding myths of Protestantism, that uh, all of these things were later additions that were brought into uh, the church and that were, you know, alterations or even adulterations of, uh, of the original pristine faith. Um, and that, in the words of uh, C.S. Lewis, there is something like a mere Christianity that is kind of, you know, you know, bare bones Christianity that just is sort of, you know, doctrines and, and, and uh, you know, prayers and so on, but none of these other things. Well, that is absolutely not true. And, and the thing that proves that that is not true, the writings that prove them are the apostolic fathers, because inside of these writings that go back very, very early, as I said, right to the, you know, very, the time of basically of the last writings of the New Testament themselves, and then onward for the next 20 or 30 years or so, um, the last of the apostolic fathers, uh, you know, the shepherd of Hermas or the epistle to Diognetus maybe could be dated at the very latest to maybe 130 or so, 140. Um, but most of these others are very, very early. So the epistle, epistle of Barnabas is, uh, uh, of Barnabas is right, is go, goes to from the 90s uh, AD. The Didache sometimes is thought to be a little bit later than that, maybe the first decade of the second century AD, as we're going to see the epistles of St. Ignatius tonight that we're going to look at, were written in 108 AD. Um, uh, and uh, Polycarp is, is actually a, a contemporary of St. Ignatius. He even writes one of his letters to him. You know, they're all right back from the very beginning, and yet they all talk about the very things that we take as bedrock orthodoxy. So they are, mere Christianity is orthodoxy. That is, that is the main message that I want us all to kind of come away with uh, after we study the Apostolic Fathers. Uh, um, and um, now, 
it, it is a very uh, it is therefore a very fruitful study, a very uh, very beneficial study to look into these ancient writings. Uh, God willing, we could go through them all. I would be happy to spend the next co couple of months or uh, or so going over each one of these documents because they're also so fascinating. Now, uh, I want to talk obviously tonight specifically about Ignatius, um, and uh, in particular the seven letters that have come down to us. Um, it is, a, it is a complicated sort of history there, there um, in, terms of the, uh, in terms of how these letters have reached us, because these letters originally, um, the, the seven letters that were written were, became well known among early Christians right away. Uh, in fact, uh, the name of St. Ignatius was widely revered in the early church. Um, he was known because of his letters and because of his martyrdom, as we're going to see. Um, far and wide. And so that later when the church historian Eusebius in the fourth century sat down to write his great history of the church from, uh, from the time of Christ up until the time of Constantine, um, uh, he immediately had recourse to these, to these letters. Now, at some point in the 400s, it seems, uh, a heretical Christian took these genuine letters and began to both interpolate stuff inside of them and also to write entirely fabricated letters under the name of St. Ignatius. And, um, and then that collection of interpolated letters as well as entirely false letters combined with the true letters um, was what was known uh, for the next maybe thousand years or so. However, starting in the uh, 1600s, uh, particularly under the influence of the, a certain Archbishop uh, Asher of, of, of in Ireland, um, he began to kind of, using philological methodology, uh, realize that there were certain problems with those letters, certain parts of them couldn't be uh, authenticated, that they must have been later interpolations. There's a very fascinating dialogue of letters, an, an exchange of letters that this archbishop had with my favorite English poet, John Milton, about this very issue. Um, because the, these letters show that, there, that the character of the early church was so different than Protestantism. Uh, and these scholarly Protestants were looking at these early documents, trying to figure out um, what was the nature of the early church. And, um, and so suffice it to say that there's a lot of controversy over, over things, but ultimately in time, the original unadulterated letters only existing in the original Greek were later on found in manuscripts and uh, uh, they vindicated a lot of, the, um, a lot of the, the judgments that this Archbishop Asher had made. And so now we have that full collection of the seven genuine epistles of St. Ignatius, okay? So just, if, you, if you're interested in looking into this issue further, you might come, there's a whole study you could do just on that, about the history of these letters. But what we're going to look at tonight are the actual words of the saint going back to the year 108 AD. Now, um, he, is the, he is the Bishop of Antioch. Okay, now Antioch is one of the great cities of the East. It is uh, a city, obviously, that in, in terms of Christian history, goes right back to the very time of the apostles. We read, for instance, in the Acts of the Apostles, uh, 1126, that the disciples of our Lord were first called Christians in the city of Antioch. And uh, after Jerusalem, this was the, the, the second major Christian kind of locus uh, in, the, in the early decades uh, of the apostolic age. Um, the apostles missionized them, and uh, uh, according to tradition, this was the original seat of St. Peter. And uh, I might as well go into this, since, uh, uh, since it is a topic that might be uh, pressing for you at some point. Uh, St. Peter was never the bishop of Rome. Uh, this is, uh, uh, he was the bishop of Antioch. He, um, uh, this I know is is a uh, might sound as a controversial statement, but it really isn't. He was uh, never the bishop of, of Rome. The first bishop of Rome was Linus, um, who left his own apostolic succession there. Saint Peter did uh, reach uh, the end of his life as a martyr in Rome. He did end his life there, but uh, he was not actually the bishop of Rome. Um, and uh, further proof of this fact is is the fact that when Saint Paul writes his epistle to the Romans, uh, which we read in the New Testament, he does not make any mention of St. Peter being the bishop there. He never says 
my greetings to my brother, uh, Apostle Peter. Um, there's no mention of him made there whatsoever. He was, P Peter was the first bishop of Antioch. And then there was a second bishop named Evodius. And, um, and then third in line was St. Ignatius. Okay. Um, now, at, at this point, we kind of want to, we don't really know about a lot of the early years of St. Ignatius, except for one a very significant detail that the church holds as a tradition I'll talk about later on. But um, our story really begins in this year, 108, um, in a time of persecution. Now, uh, it, it of course is known to all of us that the all of the early apostles, uh, all of the all of the apostles and the uh, and the early missionaries of the faith, almost entirely ended their lives in martyrdom. Okay, now <clears throat> persecution of the church uh, dates primarily to the year sixty four A.D. This was the year of the great fire of Rome under the Emperor Nero. Um, it is believed by it was certainly uh, suspected by a lot of ancients and it is believed by most scholars that nero himself was responsible for this terrible fire that started and um and, ru and rumor about the, the fact that he started the fire himself so as to clear space for his massive building project uh that he wanted to build for his own kind of pleasure palace the domus aurea uh he he he, he lit this fire that wiped out many regions, many kind of zip codes of the ancient city of Rome. Um, but rumor began to get out about that. And so he decided to uh, kind of blame somebody else as scapegoats to divert the attention from himself. And on hand were this small group of Christians who were living in Rome. Probably at the time, there were no more than several hundred uh, Christians living in Rome at that time of the year 64. And therefore, uh, this was the first moment when the Romans uh, officially began to persecute Christianity. They were brought in and charged with arson and were martyred, oftentimes in arenas. The famous uh, phrase that is the damnatio ad bestias, the condemnation to the beasts being thrown to the wild animals in the arena for the delight of the mob. Um, now, and then that was the end of it that year. This was the same persecution that, that the apostles Paul and Peter were caught in when they were murdered. Um, but then it ended. Uh, however, what, what happened because of that was that it left Christians in a very um, sort of um, ambiguous state because it meant that there was no specific the law that said that Christianity was illegal. Uh, what that meant was precedent was very, very important in Roman law. So what that meant was that in the future, any Roman emperor or any even provincial governor or anybody who wanted to instigate a persecution against Christianity could always just look back to what was known as the Institutum Neronianum, that was the precedent of Nero. And, uh, and that is what happened. So that if there ever was, for instance, a crop failure, or if there ever was some other natural disaster, an earthquake, or a drought, or a flood, or something like that, um, and then a group of people in a town said, hey, something must be going on, the, the gods must be angry with us, it must be because of these Christians, then they could denounce their neighbor, their neighbors uh, to the local magistrate and say, you know, these guys are Christians. And that magistrate would have all the power he needed to, um, to, to execute them or to torture them or to any, you know, do any other horrible thing, uh, throw them to the beasts, uh, 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 as we'll see St. Ignatius was. So this meant that for the next really until the year 250, things change in that year, but for the next almost 200 years, Christians inside of the Roman Empire faced persecutions that if I were to characterize them in three words, they would be sporadic, localized, and brief. Uh, so that sometimes, you know, uh, persecutions would erupt in a certain area, and for entirely for the reasons that I've just articulated, um, and then they would be over within, you know, and we have many accounts of this. Uh, the account of the martyrdom of Polycarp is a perfect example, where the mob denounces Polycarp and his other Christian fellow, uh, uh, you know, just, um, 
parishioners um, to the to the magistrate, and they are brought to the arena and they're you know and they're martyred there. Um, <clears throat> we have many accounts of this going on in all sorts of different parts of the Roman Empire. So, uh, but in other parts of the empire, there might it, things might be more peaceful. There might be no uh, persecutions at all. Um, at any given point, you might have some persecutions flaring up, but at other times, in, in, or even at the same time in other places, uh, you'll have relative peace, okay? And this is this very ambiguous, very strange kind of um, setting for what we're going to be talking about with St. Ignatius. We don't know exactly what was the immediate cause of the martyrdom of why St. Ignatius was arrested in, uh, in the year 108. This is under the reign of the Emperor Trajan, in case you want. Um, but probably it was some kind of natural disaster that led the city's populace to look for a reason for the gods' anger. And um, it was obviously known that there was a large Christian population there who refused to worship the gods, who refused to worship the emperor in, in you know, the standard sort of civic religion of the Romans. And they were probably blamed for this, rounded up, and... Um, uh, and then brought before the magistrates, okay? Now, because St. Ignatius was the bishop and not just a lay Christian, he was probably considered to be too big of a prize to just uh, execute in the local amphitheater in Antioch. And so the magistrate of Rome decided to make a present of him to Emperor Trajan and march him all the way over from Antioch uh, to Rome, a journey that took a very, very long time on foot and um, he, was, uh, he was led by a squad of soldiers. He called them in his letters, uh, the 10 leopards. These men were apparently very brutal and very crude. Um, and they marched him on foot across Asia Minor, which would be modern day Turkey, and then up the Western coast uh, of Turkey, uh, and then over into Northern Greece, and then onwards all the way ultimately into Rome. And he walked in chains the entire time, um, uh, then ultimately, he be, well, before he would cross over into Greece, he went to the city of Troas, which was the ancient city of Troy, and there he was put on a ship and carried to Rome, where the wild beasts awaited him, okay? Now, while he was on his way there, uh, his captors made rest stops in several towns along the way. And since no persecution was occurring in those areas, delegations of Christians came out to encourage him and to kiss the chains of the Holy One who was about to die for Christ. These are his words that he writes in his letter to Polycarp. Uh, Ignatius and these leopards, as he calls them, then resumed their grim march. And at subsequent rest stops in Smyrna and Troas, Ignatius wrote letters to the churches that had sent representatives to honor him. And these are the seven letters, rather brief letters that he managed to finish before embarking at Troas um, uh, onto, onto a ship that would take him to Rome. And they serve for us as basically his last will and testament, if you like. By the providence of God, these letters have survived, although be it in this very kind of, um, you know, with this, with this difficult history that I described, but, they, they, we can be quite sure, mo almost unanimous agreement now exists among scholars that these seven letters are authentic um, and they have been available in their authentic form since the 19th century. Um, and in these letters, we see what was in the mind and the heart of a true Bishop of Christ as he was marching off to martyrdom. And if I could just kind of speak from my own heart about this, the first thing that stands out, really, when you one reads the letters of St. Ignatius, is a man who is passionately in love with our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, in fact, 300 years after the martyrdom of Ignatius, the great saint of the church, John Chrysostom, described Ignatius, quote, <clears throat> as a soul seething with divine eros. This is the way he puts it. And, uh, you know, that, that is a term, of course, that many holy fathers of the church use to describe um, things. Now, we shouldn't obviously get, take that in the wrong way. Obviously, when we, when we speak about divine eros, we mean this kind of burning love of the heart that supersedes and goes beyond anything physical or anything fleshly of any kind. 
Um, and it is just a pure, a deep, deep desire and a deep longing to, to be with God. Um, he was a very prominent bishop in one of these very prominent cities of the Eastern Roman Empire. Um, but nevertheless, he is extremely humble. And to the end, he is a teacher whose letters address various both doctrinal issues within the church and also disciplinary issues within the church that were of vital importance. And they give us, as I say, a real um, strong piece of evidence, many strong pieces of evidence to show that uh, that the nature of the church was exactly the same in its earliest days as it is now. Okay. Uh, before he was bishop, uh, he was a disciple. Okay. And a disciple, not in the strict sense of being one of the 12 apostles, but he was a disciple of Christ in his heart. And although he did not voluntarily surrender to the authorities, he understood that his arrest only could have happened by the will of Almighty God. In his condemnation, he saw, therefore, the greatest opportunity of his life to give witness to faith in Jesus Christ. And that, of course, is what the word martyr in Greek actually means. It means a witness. And his words, therefore, are even, uh, are even more poignant for us because he sealed them with the blood of, of, of martyrdom. Okay. Uh, he saw this as his final destiny the laying down of his life as a sacrifice out of love for Jesus Christ. Um, however, Ignatius also saw his death as a sacrifice of love with Jesus Christ, a sacrifice uh, united to Christ's own sacrifice for the church. And this is, this is um, a very deep understanding of, uh, of, the, of the fathers of the church that every act of suffering in a Christian's life, if it is done with faith, is in its own way an act of participation within the sufferings that our Lord experienced on the cross. Uh, every act of asceticism, uh, of fasting, of self-denial in any way, if done through faith, it, it participates and is, uh, and is somehow a, a part of the, the sufferings of Christ. Okay, this is a very deep mystery, but and of course the ultimate uh, act of suffering is martyrdom. Um, and so to each of these churches that he wrote these letters to, again and again he says, I am giving my life for you. You see, he's uh, the two greatest commandments to love God and to love one's neighbor. And he says, yes, I am suffering for our Lord, but I'm also giving my life for you, my fellow Christians. Okay, the bishops uh these early days all saw themselves as being the the, the 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 they all saw the necessity of being a good example for their flock of how to suffer and uh this is you know one of the things that really you know these early persecutions really show is just how amazing these bishops were you know we've kind of we might become in our day and age sort of disenchanted and sort of maybe even judgmental against our own bishops um, because we see them making so many accommodations with the world so often, not all of them, of course, but so often that is the case. Um, and we feel like we're being sold out, you know, uh, but uh, we should always remember that the ideal, the, the true bishop, is the one who makes no accommodations with this world, who suffers and, and, uh, and is unflinching in the face of the anti-Christian authorities of this world, uh, the powers of this world that... Um, that are, of course, on the opposite side. Uh, they are not part of the kingdom of God, but uh, they seek to, to attack it. And so the perfection of Christian discipleship is given to us in the example of St. Ignatius. And the thing that drove him forward was his burning desire to imitate the passion of my God. These are the, this is the words that he uses in his letter to the Romans. And in so doing, to become at last a real disciple, as he puts it, a genuine Christian. Uh, and he does not rest until he gets to be with God. All seven of Ignatius's letters are very compelling. But perhaps the most moving is his letter to the Church of Rome. In it, he begs the Roman Christians not to interfere with his martyrdom through some misguided love. He is called to give witness 
to be one with his savior and so therefore pleads with them not to intervene with the imperial authorities. He even says this, forgive me, he says, I know what is good for me. Now is the moment I am beginning to be a disciple. And he says the following, I shall willingly die for God unless you hinder me. I beseech of you not to show an unseasonable goodwill towards me. Allow me to become food for the wild beasts through whose instrumentality it will be granted me to attain to God. I am the wheat of God, and let me be ground by the teeth of the wild beasts, that I may be found the pure bread of Christ. Such incredibly profound and beautiful words. Um, and it is revealing, I think, and it really shows the depth of his faith. Uh, that Ignatius is all too aware of his own human frailty. And so he immediately adds right after this section, the line, if when I arrive, I make a different plea, pay no attention to me. Okay. In other words, if I all of a sudden tell you, yeah, please try to get me out of this. Don't listen to me. Okay. Incredible humility there. Incredible um, uh, sense that it is not me, but Christ who dwells in me that gives me strength. Ignatius's letter to the Romans is the um, only surviving writing from the ancient church that tells us in a martyr's own words what martyrdom meant and why it is so powerful a stimulus to the growth of the church. Uh, you see, one of the ancient patristic dicta is the phrase that was coined by Tertullian, but is echoed all throughout patristic sources, that says the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Okay, I'll say that once again, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. And what is meant by that is that the more and more the world tries to persecute and kill Christianity, the more it flourishes. And uh, now, this is a paradox, but it is true. Christianity is very uh, persecuted, and it has been throughout history. Uh, we are beginning, I think, to get a little feeling of that in the Western world. It obviously hasn't been persecuted in the West for a very, very long time. Uh, but in other parts of the world, in the Islamic world, in the China, in China, obviously North Korea, uh, and other, you know, other parts of the world, in Africa, and so on, there are many places where to profess Christianity openly will get you immediately executed or thrown in prison. Obviously, throughout the 20th century, um, uh, in Russia and in the Soviet world in general, uh, Christianity was persecuted very, very powerfully, very bitterly. And um, there were many martyrs. There were millions of martyrs in Russia, in Serbia, uh, Greece, all throughout the Orthodox world. People who, uh, in Romania, who refused to bow the neck to the godless authorities and paid the ultimate price for it. And yet, it was during those times that the church, in a sense, kind of flourished, even though it was being persecuted. The people's faith was, was much stronger than it is when everything is just fine. That's the paradox of Christianity. And it is a living proof of the words of our Lord, my kingdom is not of this world. Because uh, when we're surrounded by abundance, okay, and we just have everything we need, and we could just chill out with Netflix and Doritos and, and, and everything like that, then it's very hard to live a fervent Christian life, okay? Um, that is why the church constantly is telling us to fast and to, and to hold back with our physical uh, you know, indulgences, because uh, the more we give into this world, the less we give to Christ. And, uh, and martyrdom and persecution is the ultimate example of that, because it is the ultimate denial. And of course, we can, we can, we can see how this works, right? If, if we're constantly used to having every physical leisure and abundance and pleasure, then when, when the, the time of real hot persecution comes, and I'm sure it will in, this, in our society, uh, and the gun is put to our heads. If we're used to just having it easy all the time, will we be able to uh, finally say no and abandon everything for the, for the kingdom to come? I don't know. Uh, it's a, that's a question that we will all have to answer for ourselves. But uh, if we've been used to giving up things for, for the, along the way, then it will be a much easier thing to do. We will realize the, the, the temporariness of everything pleasurable in this life anyway. 
and uh, mm -hmm. and we will say with the Apostle John, "Come, Lord, Maranatha." Um, now, Ignatius' letter. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Ignatius and his fellow martyrs did not die for an ideology. And this is a really crucial point to make, okay? Uh, to, many people have died in, throughout history uh, for an ideology, especially in the modern age. We have political ideologists, even the Islamic event, you know, where people are willing to kill for, uh, for their ideology. That is not what a martyr is though, okay? A Christian martyr is somebody who, who does not seek persecution does not seek martyrdom but when it comes gives their love just like we would give our love uh, give our life for our children or for our spouse or for someone else we love they give it for the lord the story of saint ignatius's march is first and foremost therefore the story of his quest for perfect union with our lord jesus christ in love but ignatius the as i said the third successor of the, or I guess the second successor after uh, Peter Evodius and then uh, Ignatius at the Church of Antioch, he knew that his letters were his parting um, testament against the heresies and divisions that threatened the legacy of apostolic teaching in this area to which St. Paul and St. Barnabas had first brought the gospel 60 years earlier. And Ignatius was actually, uh, he, he oftentimes, um, he, he is, as I, as I began in my uh, opening slide here, he is known as the Theophoros, the God-bearer. And there is an ancient tradition, a very early tradition, that says the reason why he was, uh, he was called the Theophoros, or the, the God-bearer, the one carried by God, uh, is because he was the child who, when Christ called a little child into his midst and put him on his lap, and said, therefore, whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever receives one little child like this in my name receives me. There is this ancient tradition that he was that little child. It, it certainly may be. Uh, we don't, it's not a doctrine, a dogma, or anything like that, but it is a tradition. But this idea that he had this, that he was carried by God, uh, certainly I think we can we can see it in his. Uh, deep inspiration in his words, in his writings. Some people considered him, considered him a prophet who taught with supernatural insight into the power of the spirit. And therefore, Ignatius's letters, we might see them as kind of prophetic or apostolic messages addressing the specific needs of the churches of Asia Minor that he went through at this moment in history. So he goes through Smyrna, Ephesus, Magnesia, Trales, and Philadelphia. Uh, the churches of some of these cities uh, had been founded by the Apostle Paul, and others even number among the seven churches of the Apocalypse, that is uh, what we read about in Revelation 1.11. Um, but apparently in this early time, they were beset with false teachers, and they were, uh, and that probably went back right to the time of the Apostles themselves, um, and, uh, and it certainly continued into Ignatius's day. First of all, there was a group that existed that denied the divinity of Christ. Uh, this seems to have come from a Jewish source, okay, um, and are what are sometimes referred to as Judaizing Christians, okay. They basically almost all these early early heresies of the church, uh, or I should not of the church uh, against the church. Um, uh, they basically fall into two categories. There is there is one heresy that basically says that Jesus is not God. And then there's another heresy that says that he is not really man. Okay, the the orthodox the, the the authentic Christian message has always been that Jesus Christ is has is fully man and fully God. Okay, and we of course express this every single time we cross ourselves when we put our three fingers together and we you know link them in the Trinity, and then the other two fingers are the uh, are the dual nature of Christ. Okay, uh, the human and the divine. Well, apparently there was this group of Judaizing Christians who couldn't quite cope with the idea of almighty transcendent God becoming a man. And in the face of this denial, Ignatius strained to make it very clear that Jesus Christ is indeed God incarnate. And he uses that exact 
prayers in his letter to the Ephesians 7-2. Uh, in the New Testament, we find, of course, many texts that explicitly call Jesus Christ Theos, or God. One thinks of John 1-1 or John 20-28. Um, and accordingly, in Ignatius's seven short letters, he calls Jesus Christ God Theos 16 times. Okay, so this is a very very clear and very pressing point that he tries to drive at. Christ is God, okay? Nothing else is permissible. Could he possibly be using the term God in some sort of loose or metaphorical sense, you might be thinking? Uh, could he mean that some demigod or powerful angel created by God before the visible world was made became incarnate uh, in Jesus? Not at all. He is absolutely unambiguous about what he means. Jesus is the incarnation of the one who is, quote, above time, the timeless, or achronos, and unseen, aorotos, the one who became visible for our sakes, who was beyond touch and passion, yet who for our sakes became subject to suffering and endured everything for us. That is a direct quote from his letter to Polycarp 3, 2. Now, in our day and age, it is not uncommon to encounter people like the Jehovah's Witnesses or uh, even some Protestant denominations that claim that the doctrine that Jesus is God, equal in nature and divinity and dignity to the Father, was a <clears throat> pagan invention of the Emperor Constantine. Uh, this general turned emperor, the story goes, introduced the idea that Jesus was God into Christianity when he seized power in 312 AD and soon formalized it as doctrine through the puppet council of Nicaea. This is uh, not an uh, uncommon idea that I have heard put forward over the years. But Ignatius proves that this is total nonsense. 200 years before the council of Nicaea, okay, Ignatius bears clear witness to the apostolic teaching of Jesus Christ is, in the words of our Nicene Creed, light of light, true God of true God, begotten, not made, of one essence with the Father. The same group of Judaizers who denied Christ's divinity insisted on worshiping God on the Sabbath day, okay, not on Sunday. Uh, they say this is what Moses commanded. Well, to them, Ignatius responds that it was the apostles, all raised as Jews, who transferred the weekly day of celebration from the Sabbath, that is Saturday, to Sunday, the first day of the week, because this was the day of the Lord's resurrection. And in fact, in, in Russian, I don't know, Father Boran, if it's in Serbian, but the word for Sunday in Russian is actually just means resurrection, poskodesinia. Um. And I know in Greek, it is the Kyriaki, the Lord's Day. And so the, in, in all these ancient Orthodox cultures, the word for Sunday is always very clearly uh, associated with the resurrection. We the, uh, serves, it, very, we the serves have a very practical uh, word for Sunday. It's called Nedelia, which means not working. Okay. <laughs> so it explains a lot. Okay, yeah. <laughs> yes, that's interesting. Well, I mean, look, in English, we have Sunday, which is a totally pagan thing, right? Um, so the day of the sun so then there's moon day the day of the moon and so on um you know that my uh it, it actually it's interesting because in my, in my, my background you know before i became orthodox i was actually raised as a quaker and uh they they because they they recognize the pagan um like roots of all of our days of the week in english they actually renamed them all first day second day third day and so on so when i was a kid i went to first day school instead of sunday school uh but uh, that, that is a digression. Um, now, this same group of people, though, the, that tried to attack the Lord's divinity, uh, also said that we should worship on Saturday and not Sunday. Um, here we find in uh, Ignatius's reaction against this, the earliest explicit testimony to the apostolic origin of Sunday worship and the meaning behind it. Okay, so he's very clear to say that, no, the church... Uh, the church has has the authority to transfer that day of worship to to Sunday, and that is what has been done. And there are many other ancient witnesses that say this actually too. Um, 
that talk about the, the meeting of the, the, the meeting together of Christians for corporate worship together on Sundays. We read about it, of course, uh, in, even in the New Testament, in the book of Revelation, St. John talks about being uh, taken up in the spirit on the Lord's day. Uh, and of course, even also the, uh, the apostles themselves in the gospels. Uh, it says that when they were meeting together on the first day of the week, okay, uh, and then the Lord came in unto them and said, peace be unto you. Uh, so they were gathered together on, uh, on Sunday. This goes right back to the earliest days of the apostles. Now, uh, another major point um, that, uh, that Ignatius talks about is the Eucharist and the humanity of Christ. Okay. Uh, and I want to spend a little bit of time talking about that right now. Ignatius finds it necessary to inveigh against another very different type of error, because a party had arisen, evidently not of Jewish character now, but of pagan Greek origin, which had no problem seeing Jesus as divine, because, you know, they were kind of used to the idea of, you know, human beings becoming gods like Alexander the Great and stuff like that. Um, but these people couldn't simply, their problem was the other direction. They couldn't stand the idea of divinity polluting itself by being involved with material things, involved with matter, okay? And it's funny, how, isn't it, how, how these two different cultures, the Jews on the one hand and the pagan Greeks on the other, they each have their own set of temptations, their own kind of cultural baggage, as it were. Um, you know, for the Jews, God is so transcendent that, um, uh, that uh, you know, that they, they can't imagine, uh, you know, that, that, that for them, the idea of Jesus becoming uh, or being divine is, you know, is so unthinkable. But for the Greeks, uh, it's, it's the opposite, that he was divine, but he couldn't have been really man then, you see. Well, as they claimed that the divine logos did not truly become incarnate in Jesus, but rather just appeared in human form, um, they reasoned that Jesus could not actually have been born of a woman. He could not have actually died, and he could not have actually risen from the dead. Uh, so this is their heresy. Ignatius, in his letters, has no patience with this sort of nonsense. And uh, now Christian historians, church historians, have referred to these heretics as docetists, okay, uh, which comes from the Greek word dokeo, which means to appear or to seem, okay? That's what, if you read like books of patristics, like, you know, uh, scholarly works and stuff like that, that's how they refer to these people, that Christ simply appeared to be a man, but he wasn't really a man. Well, that's not what St. Ignatius calls them. He simply calls them atheists and unbelievers. <laughs> uh, and he reasons correctly, they dare to call Christ's sufferings a sham. And Ignatius retorts, it is they who are a sham. And this he says in, his letter to the Trollians, chapter 9. Ignatius is adamant that Christ is both fully man, that his body was not a mirage, an appearance or a phantasm, and that he is also at the same time fully God. We believe, he proclaims, that Jesus Christ, uh, who was descended from David, who was also of Mary, who was truly born and ate and drank, he was truly persecuted under Pontius Pilate, he was truly crucified and truly died in the sight of beings in heaven and on earth and under the earth. He was also truly raised from the dead, his father quickening him, even as after the same manner, his father will also raise us up who believe in him by Christ Jesus, apart from whom we do not possess the true life. In this statement, we can even hear the kernel of the Nicene Creed, right? There's so much there that sounds so similar to uh, to, to words that are found later on in the Nicene Creed. This is so such an important point, my dear uh, brothers and sisters, that the faith is not invented as time goes on. The faith does not evolve, okay? It's not as if the Christians before Nicaea believed something different than afterwards. That there was one faith, as we read in the Epistle to Jude, once for all delivered to the saints. And that deposit of faith uh, is further explicated and codified in clear language. Um, and sometimes words can be invented uh, to express those doctrines like Trinity and homoousios. But the reality of those, of those things was never invented. Those things, are, those things are true 
by their very nature, and we develop language to express it and to codify it. But the reality of our faith was always the same. Okay, the doctrine of the Trinity goes right back to the Old Testament. Uh, we could talk about that perhaps in some time in the future. But um, the uh, the doctrine of the of the Eucharist goes right to, back to the, it's deeply within the pages of both the Old and the New Testament. Um, all of our all of our faith is is not invented as time goes on but it is uh it is further codified and clarified and so the you can see an example of this how the words of saint ignatius are in some ways so similar to the words that are going to be used in the nicene creed because they are really nothing more than expressions of the ancient apostolic tradition the rule of faith uh, uh which, which ignatius had received from peter and from paul and barnabas and which he valiantly defended with his last breath it is notable that the very same people who were squeamish about the incarnation were also squeamish or uneasy about the eucharist and for the very same reason right ignatius says quote the following this is from his letter to the smyrnians chapter seven they hold aloof from the eucharist and from services of prayer because they refuse to admit that the eucharist is the flesh of our lord and savior jesus christ who suffered for our sins and who in his goodness, the father raised. Now, this is such an important point. Uh, I'm, again, I don't mean to, uh, to, to pick on uh, anyone here, but uh, not yet here, but I mean, I don't mean to pick on anyone at this point, uh, but the Protestants oftentimes baffle me with this um, hyper literal commitment to being hyper literal about interpreting the Bible when it comes to certain things that are not really of ultimate significance like the days of creation are they really 24-hour days or are they kind of periods of time that's not really crucial for salvation okay uh that's not really i mean i i am uh, uh a young earth creationist but that's that's not really the point it's perfectly acceptable to also have the idea of long periods of time i think um you know I'm not talking about evolution now i'm just talking about the days of creation whether they're 24 hours or whether they're long. But when it comes to John 6, and our, when Christ says, unless you eat the body of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you, they say, oh, that's symbolic. That's just a symbol. It's completely inconsistent, and it makes no sense. We are truly literal in our way of interpreting the Bible. We are Orthodox, I think. Uh, because we take those words of Christ super literally, as did the, the apostles and and the entire history of the church. And that is proven um, by many places in the New Testament. Uh, I'm thinking of 1 Corinthians 11, uh, uh, where St. Paul talks about how some many people are sick and some sleep, meaning are dead, because they have taken the Eucharist unworthily. Uh, and also uh, the, the, uh, the, the writings of the Apostolic Fathers. Uh, you just finished your study of the Didache. You know that inside of the Didache, it says very clearly in one place that confess your sins before uh before you celebrate the eucharist so that your sacrifice may not be polluted okay and this is precisely what we do we always have to go to confession at some point before con communion uh it, not necessarily the night before but you know some point in the in proximity to it maybe you know you know what i'm talking about this is the same thing uh, we see in, in uh, St. Ignatius from right at the same time, early the first decade of the second century. Um, Ignatius is not a sophisticated theologian in the sense that, uh, you know, that later on uh, Catholic um, uh, councils and stuff will try to use Aristotelian logic to explain how it is that the Eucharist can look like bread and wine and yet be actually the body and blood of Christ. Um, uh, Ignatius does not try to, how to try to explain all of that sort of thing, um, you know, by ex accidents and essence and things like that. He simply asserts emphatically that the Eucharist is the historical body of Jesus and is no mere phantasm. Okay, the Eucharistic body of Christ is not some empty symbol. It is, it is God taking on flesh and blood, and that flesh and blood is truly given to us in the Eucharist which he calls, and this is his letter to uh, the Ephesians, chapter 20, he calls the Eucharist, quote, the medicine of immortality and the antidote which wards off death but yields continuous life and union with Jesus Christ. Again, such beautiful words. 
He also talks about the unity of the church. Uh, and this is a very important point as well. This further topic that Ignatius touches upon repeatedly in his letters, namely the nature of the church, the community that Christ uh, has established on earth. Uh, this hero letters provide us with the very earliest surviving use of the term Christianity, by the way, um, also gives us the earliest written designation of the church as Catholic. Now, for some people, uh, some Orthodox people, that may not sit well with you, but it really does not need to be a cause of temptation. Uh, the term Catholic, Catholicos, in Greek simply means universal. But it's, me, it's more than that, though, in a sense, though, too. But it definitely has, it has nothing to do with the idea of Roman Catholic here in that sense, okay? It, is, it, it means the, the entirety of the church, okay? Um, and for Ignatius, really what, uh, what he means by this is that the church is more than just a collection of isolated and disconnected congregations. Rather, it is the united and universal community of believers in Christ that is in contrast to the pagan regional cults that um, were common in his day. Uh, you know, if you were born in Ireland or in Gaul or something like that, then you would worship Celtic gods. And if you were born in Egypt, then you would worship Egyptian gods. And if you're born in, I don't know, Greece, you would work, worship Greek gods and so on. But no, the church, in contrast to all of this, is intended to be the one body of believers and includes all people and extends over the whole world. And indeed, it includes even more than anything on this world because inside of the church Catholic are the angels, the saints, the most holy Theotokos, and of course, at, our, at its head, our Lord Jesus Christ. We find everywhere in the letters of Ignatius a passionate commitment to express, deepen, and preserve the Catholic unity and solidarity of all Christians. Through his letters, we see that his pastoral concern could not limit itself to his congregation in Antioch only, but it extends over all the churches of Asia Minor. You see, he really is a true bishop. He looks at himself as the, the shepherd of his flock, wherever that flock may be. Uh, he is concerned with the church everywhere. And we see that sense of universality of how each local church uh, is addressed in Ignatius's letter, uh, letters, um, in the sense that each one of those congregations is led by a single bishop um, who alone has pastoral authority over them and who, who is assisted by his, his uh, priests, of course, together with his deacons, and that hierarchy is clearly laid out inside of his letters, this tripartite structure of the, of the clergy, of bishops, priests, and deacons. Uh, this goes right back to the very beginning. Obviously, the New Testament also talks about bishops and presbuteroi, or you know, priests uh, and deacons. Uh, the Didache talks about that as well. This is all. It, this was not made up later on. The priesthood is essential to the to the Christian faith, to the Orthodox Christian faith. The celebration of the Eucharist is essential to the Christian faith. You do not have Christianity without the priesthood and without the Eucharist and all the other sacraments, okay? Uh, it is not something that can, can, that can be dispensed with. Uh, this was an institution that is uh, instituted by the Lord himself, and it is given over to the, the priesthood of the New Testament. Now, the priesthood of the New Testament is not according to the priesthood of the Old Testament that was physical in its descendancy, right? If you were part of the Levite tribe, then you could be a priest and so on, uh, and only those people. No, the, the priesthood of the New Testament is after the paradigm of the eternal priesthood of Christ. And this is oftentimes talked about in scripture, or, or I should say in the patristic literature, in the writings of the fathers, in connection to Psalm 110, where it says, um, thou art a, of Christ, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Uh, this is a very, very commonly quoted scriptural locus inside of the church fathers. And they all connect to see, if, of course, we all remember probably from the book of Genesis, Melchizedek is not a priesthood, uh, is not a priest descended from uh, any, you know, from any of the other uh, would-be established lines. He is, uh, he, he is, uh, 
a priest of God um, who uh, who is honored by Abraham himself. Abraham, you remember, uh, kind of uh, bows to him and gives him tithes of his of his goods. And it is the same Melchizedek who sanctifies bread and wine. Okay, this is the uh, this is a type, a typology of the coming of Christ and of the ultimate sacrifice that would do away with all the animal sacrifices of the of the Old Testament uh, in the Eucharist, which is really Christ offering Himself uh, for us as the ultimate and and as we call it, the bloodless sacrifice of the Eucharist. Okay, the um, the spiritual sacrifice that uh, we partake in every time we go to church on Sundays or any day. Um, now, this, uh, in, in the various New Testament allusions um, that uh, St. Ignatius refers to um, in his letters, um, we, uh, we see these, the, the, uh, the terms priests or presbyteroi uh, and, uh, and bishops, overseers, Sometimes the presbyters are called elders in certain translations, and this is a little bit um, is a little bit confusing, I think, uh, because you see, there, especially among, among certain brands of Protestantism, they would say, okay, when you when you read the word ecclesia, ecclesia, that's really just a congregation. You see, this doesn't mean church, and when you see the word presbyteros, it doesn't really mean priest; it means elder. Okay, uh, but this is a, a very good example of how you can't just take, uh, you know, learn a couple of words in Greek and then develop a whole theology around it. You have to take it in with the context and the history of the church in whole, uh, in total. And we can, and, and, it, and then when you look at it in the backdrop of everything, the Old Testament priesthood of Melchizedek and so on, all of that make, makes sense. Um, now, You, uh, he, uh, Saint Ignatius, very clearly um, articulates this idea that the bishop is is necessary for the existence of the church on earth. Okay, um, Saint Ignatius says that every church must have this structure with one bishop to whom is owed obedience and allegiance, around whom are gathered the priests, the deacons, and the congregation. He says in his letter to the Trollians 3.1, you cannot have a church without these. The one bishop in his mind seems to be both a symbol and an instrument of the unity of the church, as well as of the authority and care of our one God and Father. And so um, to preserve the unity of the church, nothing is to be done without the bishop's consent. And he will say very famously, uh, where the bishop is, there is the church Catholic. Okay, now what is he not saying here? And this is very significant. He's not saying that there is one supreme bishop called a pope, uh, by, uh, without whom you do not have a church. No, he's not saying that at all. In fact, that idea is uh, offensive, heretical, uh, and, and completely wrong. Um, the idea of a, of a monarchical papacy didn't come about until many hundreds and hundreds of years later. Uh, and it always has been at variance with the genuine Orthodox Christian teaching about this issue. All bishops have an equal, what in Greek is called a charisma or a gift of the Holy Spirit. This is where our word charisma comes from. Uh, but all bishops are equal in that regard. Okay, there is no such thing as a superior bishop. Yes, we use the term patriarch, we use the term metropolitan, we use archbishop and bishop, but those are terms to designate the administrative capacity, really, of the bishop, not to designate his, uh, his the level of kind of um, grace that he is given at ordination. You see, um, you know, a patriarch is the is the bishop over a very, very large territory, and a metropolitan over a, a, of a mother city, that is what the word means, metropolis, um, and, uh, and, you know, and so on. But it doesn't designate the the level of spiritual authority um, or, or, you know, supremacy, certainly not. With regard to the wider church beyond Asia, uh, the church Catholic, as I've been calling it, and as he calls it, Ignatius looked to the church um, as, as, they're, they're, as being, all of the churches have been uh, part of this universal church. He does, though, and this is important for all of us to understand, he, he does give a special kind of honor to the Church of Rome, 
to which he is going, okay? And this is what you see among all of the early church writers. Uh, the letter that he wrote to Rome has a slightly different tone than the other letters. Um, obviously, he was to be martyred in Rome, and that has a lot to do with this different kind of tone. Um, but it is also because the Roman church always was considered to have something of a uh, sort of preeminence, not in terms of its uh, you know, supremacy. This is a very, this is, of course, the major statement that would uh, lead to the Great Schism. The church in Rome was somehow supreme over all the other churches. No, you don't see anything like that inside of him. You, he does, though, say that the church in Rome uh, holds the first rank in charity, okay? Um, and he does say things like uh, that the church in Rome presides over the whole society of love, meaning the entire body of the church. Uh, it is, it presides. What does that even mean to preside? It means to sit first. That is really what the word presidere means, presidere in Latin means. Uh, so, and this is, a, this is a term that you will see used by um, uh, St. Gregory the theologian in the East, one of the Greek fathers. Uh, he will use the word proedros to describe the church in Rome as being kind of having a special preeminence of honor, but in, but in no other capacity. It is special because obviously the capital of the Roman Empire was there. Saints Peter and Paul were martyred there. There is something special about Rome um, at the, in these early days, in these early centuries. But it is certainly nothing uh, of these kind of doctrinal idea that one sees developed in the medieval papacy. Okay, there's no evidence for that in these early church writings. Okay, uh, the first time you really begin to see little kind of the morphing of that idea of, uh, of the church in Rome having a special honor into the idea of having a supremacy or being somehow apart from the other churches doesn't come out really until maybe the 400s and into the 500s and then uh, and then it kind of snowballs from there. We could talk about that later though. Um, maybe I'll just kind of wrap it up now because I've been going on for some time but um, in begging the Roman Christians not to intervene to stop his martyrdom he seems to be saying that they who are renowned for so many martyrs, so many who witnessed with their blood for the love of the good shepherd should not greedily reserve this privilege for themselves. True charity, true love demands that they should allow this poor Bishop from Antioch to share this honor. And I will just kind of end with this last quotation here. For if you are silent concerning me, I shall become God's. But if you show your love to my flesh, that is, if you try to stop me from becoming martyred, I shall again have to run my race. Pray then, do not seek to confer any greater favor upon me than that I be sacrificed to God while the altar is still prepared, that being gathered together in love, you may sing praise to the Father through Christ Jesus, that God has deemed me the Bishop of Syria, worthy to be sent for, far from the east unto the west. It is good to set from the world unto God, that I may rise again with him. For Ignatius, in the end, it all comes down to discipleship as the imitation of Christ. Uh, and even whatever preeminence the church in Rome held in honor at this time, it is certainly, uh, it is first at least in, in, in part because of, this, because of its illustrious martyrs. Going back to the apostles, who were the first to witness their love for God unto death. And St. Ignatius took his place among them. Holy Father Ignatius, pray to God for us. Amen. Glory to God. Thank you, Father Matthew. Uh, I was uh, just, uh, let me see here the, uh, in the chat room. I had some questions that... Uh, Maybe it will be interesting to answer. Let me just see here. Okay, the host. Okay. So I, I think Father, this will work very nice uh, with with the hosting. Uh, you can always yes. The, we, can, we can do that, and we'll uh, we'll work very very smooth. God willing, next time. Okay. Father, wonderful. Thank you. I wanted to thank you a lot for for uh, and appreciate a lot for being with us, and I hope. Those will be just uh, one out of many, many uh, lectures that we're going to hold. Of course, on our Bible studies, we talk about different subjects. We we just uh, uh, we found ourselves now that we're going to want to talk about the early church fathers. Maybe next time we can talk about some more St. Polycarp or some of the other saints at that uh, that period of time. 
Absolutely. But we will uh, we will continue to do to do this. So regarding certain questions that we have, um, I think of course uh, one of the questions was what year was the uh, the can you please tell me what year Ignatius writes those letters? So uh, it, it was 108. 108. 108. Yes. So basically, in the year 106, the Emperor Trajan is the one who is trying to starts with the persecution, and so yes. we are talking about at the beginning of the of the first century. That's how that's how early the, the, this is, and this is why it's very important. That's right. That's right. So this is uh, again someone gave a. Um, uh, a comment about uh, the Second Corinthians chapter thirteen one. They collected offerings and gathered on the first day of the week, which is in the Corinthians, talking about the Sunday as the day of worship. I will just add one thing uh, that that uh, I noticed when it comes to the Sunday. We talked even about this before. The reason why we celebrate the Sunday uh, as the day of the worship is also because it is indeed the first day of uh, uh, of the week. Uh, however because Christ resurrected the first moments of what we call the mystical time of the Sunday of the, of the resurrection. We, we take this Sunday as, as our apostles have been given to us uh, in the whole tradition to celebrate. Actually, it's uh, 1 Corinthians 16, 1 to, uh, to 2. So, okay. Uh, I, I would, Father, I would like to add, I love when you, when you said, because it's this martyric ethos, we talked about this a lot. You know, we, we always refer to these words of St. Uh, Joseph the Hesychus, who said, you need to spit blood in order to receive the Holy Spirit. And he talks about two types of martyrdom. The one is literal one, that like we see with St. Ignatius. But the other one is metaphorical or, or noetical, when, when people live in the desert and they have uh, abandoned everything. They, they have taken up their cross, denied themselves, and uh, have uh, started to go on a path that is, uh, again, another good type of martyrdom uh, similar to the, the ones that we can see, we can see in, in St. Ignatius. So one of the things that you mentioned, I was trying to look at online a little bit more, that the, you talked about the love that he had for Christ, because I, I remember this funny story, I'm not funny, it's a very, very tr dramatic story actually, that, that it came to my mind uh, about uh, when the Christians were being executed in the Colosseums, there are some witnesses in what I was reading in the Life of the Saints, that sometimes even the children, when they would see that their parents would be taken off into the Colosseums to be eaten by the beast for the pleasure and enjoyment of the elite, uh, who were seeing that as a theatrical performance, they would run towards them and they would like to die with them. It was, it's quite an amazing, amazing thing to, to be able to endure such a, uh, such a martyrdom. So maybe Absolutely. give us a little bit inside of that, because you mentioned the word love. And I, I know in Greek, there's many words about love. Uh, one of them yes, is yes. eros. I don't want people to confuse it. It's a passionate love, what means in Greece, some Greek, which means it's something since Simon the theologian, the new theologian talks about it a lot. But there's also the, um, the, the word storgi in Greek, which also means the, the, the tenderless love, which is what usually mother has for her children. They have philia, which is an intimate, authentic friendship, brotherly love, sisterly love. And of course, we have the agape, which is sympathetic, universal love, which we use it for when we, when we do it uh, in church after liturgy. But also we have other ways of love, like philoftia, which is self-love. Also ludus, which is also like a playful, flirtatious uh, love. Pragma, which is uh, committed, compassionate love, and so on. So it's an amazing thing how, you know, uh, in this world we live in, uh, how people like St. Ignatius are, have been given by God such a grace from the Holy Spirit to endure this persecution because he was, a, I guess he was a very old man when he was taken to the Colosseum. He must have been, yes, that's right. That's right. And, and to be eaten by the beasts and uh, by the pictures you showed us, uh, looks a very 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 uh, scary on, on one hand but also graceful on the other hand yes well it is amazing when you think about it and uh you know and and just how how in in the world right now you know if, as i said like you know in the islamic world in china north korea and these places you know there have been there, there are on almost on a daily basis there are people who are giving them giving their lives over for christ you know um yes I, I don't know if you know the story about, I think his name was uh, Isaiah the, or, or Isaac, I forget the name of, no, Evgeny. 
Martyr of Guinea. He was a Russian soldier killed by the Chechens. Oh, yes, he's very uh, famous. In 1995, and I saw the video of his murdering. He was caught by Muslim um, leaders at the time, radical leaders who were fighting the Russian Federation. This is in the 1995, 1996, I think. And on camera, at that time, YouTube was still not that popular. So, uh, but it was on some social media at the time, maybe a little bit later came that footage. And just because he didn't want to take off his cross, right, yes. uh, they slaughtered him in front of a camera and then distribute this footage to yeah. media to scare the people. And, but it was amazing that this, and he was only 18 or 19 years old soldier, yeah. Russian soldier who said, brother, I would rather die than you know, be, yeah. uh, take off my cross. So we have this testimonies of uh, martyrdom all around the world. Just look at Egypt, look at Syria, look at yeah. many places today in the world where just we don't talk about those things very often, which is kind of, uh, kind of strange. You, well, unfortunately, especially in America, where our own government is supporting many times the people who are doing these things, you know. Yeah, that's uh, scary so, truth. Yeah, it's yeah. Scary thing, yeah. Very scary thing and very, very dangerous because uh, may, may God help us all. But the paradox, as you started in your lecture today, was that we see uh, that the more blood was shed, the more uh, Christian seed flourished and came forth. And, and glory to God that uh, the persecutions are basically good for us so that we can, you know, strengthen our, our faith. So uh, th that was amazing. I would, I would like to ask you, Father, so when you talked about the, the parallel between the Rome as a, uh, uh, let's say, the sitting, uh, city at the time, that would, that, that's a time, the reason why St. Ignatius doesn't call the Roman church uh, a head church is because at the time, as we know, Christ did not, of course, ordain one apostle, like this right. Peter, but 12 of them, and plus yes. 20 other disciples. They all became apostles. They all became relevant. Yes. We, we can measure them uh, one next to each other. So uh, St. Ignatius, when, when he says, even in the church, it's true, I don't want, I want to ask you about this, when we serve together, for, let's say, a few priests, 10 priests, there's always only one, that's right, what yeah. we call the proistamenos, who is doing the service. But that doesn't mean that one priest is in any way above the other priests. That's right, yes. That's, that's exactly the point, uh, you know, with, with the bishops. Uh, you, know, the, the, you know, this was, and, and this was so totally taken for granted, um, uh, you know, by all, all of the early uh, popes, so-called popes of Rome. I mean, you know, we have to be careful, obviously, with that word. The, the word itself is not necessarily bad. We use that term to describe certain saints who were uh, the bishops of Rome in the early days. But what came to be known as the papacy, that's that's what we obviously don't believe in. That is the heresy, you know. The, 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 the papal myth is that this one bishop of Rome has somehow a special... Uh, connection over above any other bishop, a special connection to God, and that only through him does the rest of the church, you know, have access to grace. Um, and, you know, this is just ludicrous. And, uh, you know, we've never, never had this. In fact, if we, if we get a chance, maybe one day we'll take a look at St. Clement of Rome, uh, you know, the, um, one of the other early apostolic fathers, who, who was his pope, letter... He was, a, he was a pope. He, he was a pope. That's right. That's right. And uh, you know, and his his letter to the Corinthians dates from the late nineties A.D. So very very early on. And he he what it, the context of that letter is that there's a big problem in the church in Corinth. You know, because uh, obviously you know, even from Saint Paul's letters, we know that that was a problematic parish. You know, yeah. <laughs> and. Um, uh, and so Clement uh, is, is writing to them and he gives like a very, very long explanation telling them, you guys can't do this. You have to, you have to treat your priests better. You know, you, you kick them out basically, but never once during that whole time, does he say, I'm the Pope and you better listen to what Rome said. You know, he never says that, you know, so that's, it's that's it, important, very, very important yeah. to, to emphasize. Well, I have a few questions. I don't want to uh, oh, cue off, but uh, some people have. When do we as Orthodox decide that to die for Christ is better than to lead others? And the desire to be martyred, to, to be with Christ and God supersedes the need to serve as we are called. 
Yes, yes, this is an interesting uh, distinction to make. Obviously, the church has never, and actually, um, the, the church in the early centuries when martyrdom was such a, a common reality among Christians, you know, you could literally convert to Christianity in the morning and be martyred in the evening. Um, uh, so in those early centuries, the church talks about how, w what should be one's attitude towards um, uh, towards this reality of martyrdom. And what you see is there, there are two kind of principles at work here. On the one hand, the church very clearly articulates you should never go out and try to seek martyrdom. You should never try to do things that are deliberately provocative so that you can kind of incur, incur martyrdom on yourself. And in, and in fact, in one of the uh, early councils of the city of Elvira in Spain, which I believe the council there was held in like 302, or just before the, the great persecutions broke out. Um, the, uh, there's a canon that actually says, any person who goes into a pagan temple and spits at the idols or smashes them or whatever, and then gets martyred them, that's not, that's not martyrdom. Uh, so, you know, you shouldn't go out there and try to provoke it. But at the same time though, there is also a very clear message among the church writers at the time. I'm thinking specifically of Origen. He was a wonderful little treatise called The Exhortation to Martyrdom, that you, you can't flee from it either. You can't, um, you can't, well, you can't, you can try to, you can try to protect yourself. You can move to another city if you need to or whatever. But at the same time, that ultimately when it's, when you can't run anymore, you have to embrace what God has given you, you know? And, um, you know, this, so these two, these are the two things to balance out. Don't go out and look for, um, for trouble. But at the same time, though, when it is inevitable, you have to just take it as God's will, you know. Yes, because the following answer, someone also commented, said, well, it is the Holy Spirit. Indeed, it is basic when our time, time is, has come for, for martyrdom. It is the Holy Spirit who calls. Even the apostles, they run from one city to another. So right, right. Even right. defends himself. I am a Roman citizen. But right. when the, his time is uh, due right. for, for martyrdom in Rome, he, of course, he, he is being killed. They have uh, some other uh, questions actually coming. Being killed for the sake of Christ is itself a witness to others. Others is uh, put in parentheses, uh, meaning um, in quotations, I'm sorry. Uh, so yes, Jennifer, that, that's, uh, that's what we're talking this. But and she asks, is this the Holy Spirit which guides us? She's asking about martyrdom. So uh, my answer will be, Father, yes, it is only the Holy Spirit who can lead us to martyrdom. Because if we try to do it on our own, right. we'll end up like that story between Safprikios and Nikiforos, the, the, the priest and, the, and that martyr who, who got into fight and the one was not forgiving and then ended up losing his martyr, martyric uh, riff and salvation. So I, I guess it was the Holy Spirit because how else I would, uh, you know, how else we can embrace martyrdom without the Holy Spirit? Isn't it? Exactly. It's the greatest gift that the Holy Spirit gives, you know, to, to, to end one's life, you know, for Christ's sake. Yes. Uh, so uh, it was, uh, uh, I'm seeking guidance, is what they used to call this uh, to action. So, uh, yes, I think Father, Father Matthew, uh, guys, all, he, he clarified that it's one thing when we, uh, when we're, let's say, invited to martyrdom by Christ, where we're ready to 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 for martyrdom it's completely different thing when we're asking uh, for it i remember father i don't know if you if you remember two three years ago this i think it was a baptist missionary or, or some some sort of that he ended up in i think in some place in south america where he wanted to convert certain tribes that never had a civilization contact with a civilization what ended up they they literally killed him and they left him on the on the beach for, for days. No one was able to approach him, pick him up and, and you know, bury him. As far wow. Was, was this the, was this actually in the Indian Ocean? Or is it in the Indian Ocean? Yeah, yes, yeah. yes. Was, I, I read about that. Yeah. yeah. I think he was from here, from, from the States. Yes. He, he yes. was the one who, and there was a debate. I mean, was he his dead martyric one or he was, let's say, maybe foolish for uh, tempting the Lord in, in such a way to, to do to Yeah. Do Yes, uh, you know those kind of things obviously are, uh, you know, God, God will judge that. You know, uh, you know, when I first, I remember hearing about that story, and I remember thinking to myself, my first instinct was like, okay, this is just some like idiot like YouTuber who was like wanting to get like a lot of likes or whatever. And so, and then, I, but then when I looked into it some more and I read some of the things that he actually wrote about, and he seemed to have a very genuine love. He said, I just really want to share 
Christ with these people, you know, and, um, uh, you know, so it's, it's, it's obviously one of those things that God knows. I'm, I'm sure, you know, uh, you know, yes. I'm sure that God will take care of him, you know, in one way or another. But on the same subject, is not martyrdom if I put a cross uh, on around my neck and go into Baghdad or I don't know in Saudi Arabia and so convert your your infidels? Right. Yes. That's not. If I get killed, then I'm just stupid and and <laughs> right I'm an idiot for doing that. Right. Not exactly. Uh, how we? Yeah. Glory to God. Okay, guys. Uh, if you have any questions, feel free to either raise your hand or comment or just uh, just ask. Unmute yourself. Uh, uh, Father Matthew is. Our man, he, he, he knows us very well. He knows you. Uh, Isaiah. Yeah, Isaiah, go ahead. Hello, hey. my friend. Hi. Hey, it's good to see you, Father. Thank, you, so, uh, thank you so much. I uh, Loving it, loving it, loving it. Oh, I'm so happy. Um, I did want to ask, so um, as far as, as seeking a martyrdom, I think we have a few saints from the from Greece, from the, from the 1900s who actually did it's it, reading the lives of the saints it looks like they did just that like <laughs> like yeah i was from this town and then it got taken over by muslims and then i left but then i went back I, usually um i think it's also a theme where uh they apostatized typically wow. also um and then went back quite deliberately or um uh i think there's some other saints and as far as spitting on idols uh i think i i seem to remember a few saints actually taking yeah. fights it's the saint is the saint of verki who is actually pictured in, in in the icons with a hammer uh who apparently would go around like lopping the, <laughs> the heads off of idols and stuff like that um yeah you know I, yeah I, so, so I, I guess what i'm uh, now it is true though that the council of elvira I mean, you could you could that is a you, you could look that up online it, it does have some canon i could even find the number for that um where it talks about that i would i would only and, it, and it, you know in in that same council interestingly enough it even talks about like um clerical celibacy and stuff like that and and how like you know like so it wasn't ever accepted as a as a universal council it was a local council so um you know, it's not like an infallible doctor, you know, document. Um, I would just, I would say that like, you know, sometimes it happens that certain holy people have an individual kind of, you know, message from God that kind of doesn't, you know, maybe it supersedes the rule. Do you know what I mean? Like um, in, in St. Augustine's con uh, talking about suicide in, in the opening uh, books of the city of God. Um, he, you know, he, he's, he, he sees, it's a very poignant uh, discussion, actually, because the Romans, you know, basically one of their cultural things was that they looked at suicide as a, as a noble act, you know, and he's, and his whole point in mentioning this is that this is totally at variance with Christian teaching, that uh, suicide is, is totally wrong, and it is, uh, you know, it's, it's a terrible sin. He goes, he goes, but if you're going to ask me, well, what about this? What about Samson in the Old Testament? Or, you know, what about uh, either, like certain of these? He goes, I can only say that sometimes it happens that an individual person has a special message from God that maybe, you know, kind of breaks the rule, but it's it's somehow part of God's you know plan for that individual. And, and in a way that they that they know they're getting a special revelation. So it might be that there are some saints who got a special message that they needed to go and do this you know uh but the general rule see the the, the thing that, that a lot of the uh people who who try to be cautious about martyrdom in the early church they say it, it could proceed from pride you know that a person can kind of feel like a sense of self-importance and like you know kind of glory seeking or whatever you know and then Maybe they would even, uh, I think there are even incidences of this. Father, you, maybe you can uh, tell us, I don't remember the exact specifics, but of, of elements of, of the lives of the saints where like, some hot-headed young person might want to go and court martyrdom only to get arrested. And then when he's actually looking at the jaws of the lions, you know, renounces Christ to save his own skin, you know. Um, so like, if, if it's not given from God, uh, you know, you don't, you wouldn't want to fake it, you know, because ultimately it'll, it'll always lead to something bad. You know what I mean? So it, it might be. I'm, I'm sure. I'm sure that you know. Sure, there have been situations. I know there have been where there are saints who maybe did these kind of, you know, these kind of uh, tough guy kind of things. You know, I don't know what, how to describe it. You know, these. I'm thinking Saint Boniface is just like, yeah, Thor's tree. 
take an axe to it. <laughs> like, yikes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, and 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 but no doubt they had some special yeah. A special blessing from God to, to do this, but we, you know, we have to be careful about not because it's very easy to imitate external things. You know, this is the this is always the temptation for us converts as well. You know, when you go, if you spend time in a monastery, you go to Mount Athos or something like that. You know, it, it's very easy to 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 um, copy the external things, to walk around with a prayer robe, to you know, I don't know, wear all black or something like that. You know, those are the kind of ex external things that are easy to copy, but to to copy the humility and the self-sacrifice and stuff that's a very difficult thing uh you know th there was a priest in in uh in, where you know i'm part of rokor and um who uh he he was reading in the life of saint seraphim of saroff that uh every day whenever he would meet people no matter what time of the year it was he would always greet them with the words christ is risen um you know because he, the resurrection was so much a reality for his life you know and uh, and so this one priest basically thought like you know i'm gonna do that you know <laughs> and so he started like you know every, every time he would talk to people you know it was in you know september or whatever christ is risen you know and uh and it got to be kind of like uh, it got it, he became known for this and then a bishop actually got a hold of him and said don't do that anymore uh you know that, unless you can imitate what saint seraphim how he lived you can't do that you know um you yeah. know what i mean where the babushkas in the temple will, will straight him up Right, <laughs> exactly. You mixed up the dates. That's right. Yeah, thank you, Father. Thank you for, for that uh, response. Uh, I, I think we all understand the importance of humility in everything that we approach. We, we have said many times that the humility is the language of God. And no matter what we do in life, uh, unless we have humility, uh, we will never be supported by the Holy Spirit. So in the only way to recognize what comes from God and what comes from our ego is whether we are on the scale of that uh, humbleness and humility. And that's sure. basically the, the, the most important uh, uh, fight that we have in this invisible warfare. But wow. um, yeah, uh, so I think uh, because we have, uh, it's 7.30 now, and I, we, we, want, I want, we don't want to keep you so long, Father. You have uh, your own. Oh, well, it's a real pleasure, though. Uh, but uh, uh, I guess it's true. I probably should get back to the kiddos. If anyone has a question, we can do it a little bit. But basically, we can wrap it up for, for, for tonight. So we can, you know, God willing, we can continue uh, next uh, Wednesday. Just wanted to let you know that, of course, we have liturgy on, on uh, Sunday. I'm not gonna, we're not going to have Vespers on, on Saturday. I'm not here. I have to go to Pittsburgh. But we have celebration over there. But uh, on Sunday, the liturgy is as, as usual from 9 Orthros and from 10, uh, the Divine Liturgy. So uh, we'll see you all there, guys. But uh, we will have, hopefully, next uh, Tuesday, we have the Catechism class. And next uh, Wednesday, we have, uh, again, the Bible study. If Father Matthew is available, it will be great, Father Matthew, if you can maybe uh, uh, stay with us Absolutely. the following month and be with us, you know, co-host co this thing. Okay. Once when we finish, when you finish with let's say a few scenes that we have uh, planned to to cover, sure. then we can come back to this book of Cassiani, then come back to you with with uh, some other scenes, so we can have this uh, conversation about uh, everything that is very important. But I, the whole idea here is, as I said in the beginning, was to cover the early church fathers and to understand that the Orthodox Church is following the holy tradition that was established at the very beginning uh, of, of the constitution of the church on the day of the Pentecost. And that basically when we talk about St. Irene, it's like we're talking about some old, old grandpa who was, uh, who, whom we inherited in our, in our church. And he is the father, not just of a specific people of Antioch and Syria, but a saint to the whole fullness of the church. And it's very important to learn from their experiences and what they wrote. Every time when it comes to the to the uh, to the topic of maybe Holy Eucharist, uh, of course the supremacy of the Pope, which is a false heresy, we have uh, which is a heresy on its own about other subjects that I think it's very important today because a lot of our brothers and sisters who are coming from the Protestant worldview need to hear what what the Church had to say in the, that time, especially in the first three uh, uh, centuries and later. So that we know the understand the importance of the continuity of the of the church throughout the ages up until this very day, and that even if there were certain let's say uh, changes, they were mostly superficial and only in the practical function of the church. When it comes to the Holy Eucharist, when it comes to uh, the how the church was organized at the time, and of course martyrdom and everything that that connects with it. So. Um, 
yeah, that will be, uh, guys, uh, all for, for, for today. Uh, feel free, if you have any questions for Father Matthew, uh, to email it to me. And next uh, Wednesday, we will read them. And maybe even before Father Matthew starts with his uh, lecture uh, on Wednesday, we can maybe answer a few questions. And then, of course, we can have him uh, talk to us about some other church fathers that are very important to hear. So, Father Matthew, I want to thank you a lot for oh, thank for you, Father. Today. I want you to know that secretly, the, all of us who were praying for you to come as soon as possible. Uh, well, amen. Uh, thank you. So we can serve together more often, and maybe God willing, uh, when when uh, the, the, all the conditions are right, we can even have this Bible study in a more hybrid way, half of it in person, and of course stream it online so more, more people can join. And also uh, to be able to see each other in person as well. Absolutely, Father. So, thank you so much. It was a real pleasure. And it's let us, so great to see everyone. Uh, let us uh, say, thank you, Father. Let us say the prayer and then we can uh, uh, say goodbye to, to everyone. We'll see you next uh, Wednesday. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Both now and ever into the ages of ages. Amen. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. The kingdom come, the will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, both now and in the ages of ages. Amen. What of mercy, what of mercy, what of mercy. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Amen. Dear Father, thank you once again, guys. Thank you all for being here. And uh, God willing, see you all very soon on Wednesday. Again, hopefully, if uh, Father Matthew is available again, he can Absolutely. be with us. Absolutely. Thank you, Father Matthew. Thank you, Father. And uh, thank you, everyone. Great to see you. Take care.